Hey everyone, it's great to see you. My name is Scott and I'm the Family Ministries Director here at C3. While it's exciting to see everyone join us on the live stream, we really miss your faces. God willing, we're gonna see each other very soon. Here at C3, we're all about life-changing news of Jesus, and it's our passion and joy to help lead people into new and growing relationships with Him. And regardless of your past or how close or how far you feel to God, there's a place for you here at C3. Before we get started, we'd love the opportunity to say hi. If you're on one of our platforms with chat, just hop on and let us know where you're watching from. If you're a guest checking us out for the first time, we'd love to meet you. You can either fill out our online connection card or text the word hello to the number on your screen. Speaking of hello, special shout out to all the fathers watching. Happy Father's Day. Whether you're a new dad or your kids are long since grown, thank you for being here with us. We wouldn't be where we are today without you. If you're looking for resources on fatherhood, we'd love to partner with you. Just head over to our website at C3TriCities and click on the resource menu. There you'll find a bunch of different Bible and faith-based content to enjoy with your kids. Thanks so much for being here and welcome to C3 Tri-Cities.
gonna hold my body down If you walked out of the grave I'm walking to If you walked out of the grave I'm walking to If you walked out of the grave I'm walking to If you walk down to the grave, I'm walking to you. If you walk down to the grave, I'm walking to you. Oh, oh, if you walk down to the grave, I'm walking to you. If you walk down.
together. All right, here we go. Jesus' name will break every stronghold. Freedom is ours when we call his name. Jesus' name above every other. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Jesus' Hey, C3 Pastor Mark here. If you've been a part of C3 for the last few months, you probably remember that at the end of 2019, we were talking about raising some money to be able to build a church and a school over in Guatemala. And we talked about it then, we talked about it in the spring, but then we haven't talked about it anymore. You know why? Because the world exploded. Because all of a sudden we had a pandemic. All of a sudden everything came to a screeching halt. Yes, here in Tri-Cities, yes, in the U.S., but also in Guatemala. They had to stop everything. So they weren't able to build the church yet. They weren't able to vet the kids that need to be able to, to be sponsored so that they could be part of the school. Um, but all of a sudden this last week, we finally got an update from them. So we're going to show you a video about what's going on now as they're starting things up again. And we're going to be telling you a little bit about what's going to happen in the timeline. And the gentleman that you're going to be seeing in just a moment is the pastor that's going to be overseeing the church and the school for us. Take a look at this. Bendiciones, eh, amados hermanos. En esta oportunidad les presentamos nuestro saludo, especialmente a ustedes, miembros de la iglesia C3, que no cabe duda eh, han hecho su mejor esfuerzo para poder colaborar para la plantación de, de, esta, de esta iglesia. Reconocemos que los tiempos no han sido los mejores para poder seguir colaborando con nosotros. Sin embargo, oramos para que toda esta situación que estamos viviendo, pues eh, logremos pasarlo y que nosotros, tanto así como ustedes y nosotros, tengamos la bendición de Dios y poder estar bien bajo la cobertura de Él. Bendiciones hermanos y estamos en este lugar para poder presentarles este, este lugar era un cerro que eh, al inicio pues veíamos que todo pues iba a ser fácil, sin embargo en el camino pudimos encontrar mucha roca que dificultó el trabajo para poder iniciar con la plantación de la iglesia. Sin embargo, la comunidad, la iglesia, asocia y centro estudiantil han hecho su mejor esfuerzo 
para poder avanzar con el trabajo que se está realizando. La verdad es de que la comunidad ha demostrado interés, la iglesia ha sido eh, bastión importante, la iglesia, la iglesia madre, ha sido bastión importante para poder avanzar con el trabajo que, que hoy podemos ver aquí a mis espaldas, cómo ya ha avanzado, ya las paredes están eh, ya casi al, al, a la altura máxima y luego pues vendrá el techo de, de esta, de la, principalmente de las aulas. Y gracias a Dios eh, todos hemos colaborado, la comunidad también ha hecho lo que tiene que hacer. Gracias también al pastor, al pastor de esta, de esta iglesia, quien ha colaborado bastante, lamentablemente pues por la situación, él no está presente en esta oportunidad. Así que muchísimas gracias a ustedes. La verdad es de que podemos, podemos decir que el Señor nos ha ayudado, el Señor este, nos ha bendecido y gracias al Señor aquí los, los albañiles también han hecho su mejor esfuerzo para poder avanzar hasta este momento. Queremos eh, despedirnos y animarles a ustedes que el Señor nunca nos ha abandonado. El Señor nunca les ha abandonado también a ustedes. Nosotros creemos en que el Señor siempre va a estar con, con ustedes, con nosotros, ayudándonos en este tiempo de construcción, en este tiempo de calamidad y que sin embargo pues creemos en, en la palabra del Señor de que en Cristo Jesús somos más que vencedores. Saludos hermanos, que Dios les bendiga y sigamos adelante, estamos orando por ustedes y primero Dios, muy pronto vamos a tener acá la, la plantación de esta iglesia y especialmente las aulas donde van a eh, aprender de la palabra del Señor muchos niños de aquí, de esta comunidad. Bendiciones hermanos y recuérdense, con Cristo somos más que vencedores. Hey, welcome. Uh, I'm Pastor Mark, and I'm so glad that you are here today on Father's Day. And uh, I just want to pause and tell all of you fathers, happy Father's Day. Now, you know who I'm talking to, right? I'm talking to those that are actually raising their kids. I'm talking to ones that are actually did the job to be able to raise their kids maybe to adults right now. We are so thankful for you. We're so thankful that you are on this online stream and you probably have some of your kids with you right now watching this thing. We are so thankful for that. This is a great day to celebrate dads. Moms, we celebrated you last month. This is dad's turn. And we're so excited about that. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but uh, this last week, uh, our church made all sorts of boxes uh, to be able to give out to fathers and a whole bunch, I don't know, 800, 1,000, I don't know how many people came by to pick those up to give to dad. And so if you got something like that, just well, I'm so, I, I hope it's just fun. I hope you enjoy it. And I hope you have a great Father's Day for all that you do. Today, I want to talk about our topic today. Uh, we're in week three of a series that we're talking about. Um, uh, Jesus didn't say that. Sometimes, here's what's happening. Sometimes we think Jesus said certain things that he really didn't. Today, we're actually going to be talking about uh, God wants me happy. Did, did God really say that? Did Jesus, the son of God, really say that? Did he actually say, hey, I want you to be happy? No, that is nowhere in scripture. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. But yet somehow we've got this perception 
that Jesus wants us to be happy. Jesus wants us to be uh, always excited and always just doing good things and all this stuff. And, but here's the thing. Let's be honest. Jesus didn't tell us to go be happy, but really that's what we tell ourselves, right? I mean, it's better to be happy than to be miserable, right? I mean, we would rather be, uh, how many of you at home right now would say by raising your hand, I would rather be happy than miserable. Will you raise your hand? Yeah, I'm guessing probably 100%, except maybe there's kind of those oddball ones that like to be miserable, but that's fine. But for most people, we, re- we would like to be happy. And sometimes we think that's what God is telling us, that, that God is saying, I want you to always be happy and I'm your sugar daddy. Whatever you want, whatever you want, I will give you, you just, you just tell me, I'm your cosmic Santa Claus. I am the genie in the bottle. You tell me what you want, poof, I'll make it for you. It'll just be perfect, it'll be awesome. It doesn't say that in the Bible. We wish it did, but it doesn't. It doesn't say that anywhere at all. And I'm gonna show you just through one story in the Bible. There's so many other ones we could look at. But I wanna show you in the Bible about a story that you probably already know. If you've ever read the Bible, if you've gone to church for any length of time, you've probably heard this. In fact, I know in the past I have preached on this story uh, probably at least a couple times. And the, where we're gonna look at is in John, the Gospel of John in the New Testament, John 8, verses two and three. And here's what it says. It says, at dawn... Jesus appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. Now what's interesting is Jesus is basically, he's in the temple, which to you and I, that would be the church. And so here he is in church and he's leading like a small group or he's the guest preacher that day and he's preaching and all of a sudden as he's doing this, in comes these religious leaders with a woman caught in adultery. Now, a couple questions come to my mind. Where's the guy, right? It says that they brought in the woman. Where's the guy? I mean, last time I counted to have adultery, it takes at least two people, right? They only brought one in. Where was the guy? And the second question I have is, how did they find her in the act of adultery. Was she doing it out in the street? I wouldn't think so. I'm assuming that they were probably in a home somewhere, right? And when they're in that home, how did these religious leaders find her having an affair, having an adultery? Were they peeking in the windows? Were they peeping toms? I mean, come on. This is, there's some, there's some gaps in this story. I wish they would have filled in the gaps. Why did they just bring in the lady? Why in the world? Did they even find her in the first place? I mean, it's just kind of weird, right? But that's just the part that they tell us. Now we go on. It says, they made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such woman. Now, what do you say, Jesus? Why were they, why were they, posing this question to Jesus. The last line tells us they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing Jesus. Because here's what happens. Here's what happens is that they, as the religious leaders, they absolutely hated Jesus because Jesus talked the polar opposite of what they talked about. It was all about them themselves, how how they can puff themselves up and how they are over all religion and stuff. And Jesus came and said, Man, you guys are out in left field. This is not what religion's about. And he would talk about other things and it would just tick them off. So they're always trying to find a way to get rid of Jesus. Always trying to figure out a way to get rid of Jesus. So they're asked Jesus this. So what do you say, Jesus? This is what Moses said, that, that she should be killed. What, should, what do you think, Jesus? And look at what Jesus didn't say. Because this was, a, this was a tough question. Because if Jesus, if Jesus were to say, yeah, go, go ahead and kill her, people, other people would say, well, wait, 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 time out. Where's the love? Where's the compassion? Where's the forgiveness? 
And if, if Jesus instead were to say, well, you know, let's just forgive her. Bygones be bygones. It's okay. Let's just, you know, don't do it again. Then, then, then the religious people would be saying, well, wait a minute. Are you saying adultery is not a big deal? Or are you saying that the law that Moses created years ago, we shouldn't listen to Moses? So all of a sudden, either way that Jesus responded, it would not be good for him. So what, what did Jesus do? <laughs> what well, Jesus knows what to do best. In verse six, here's what it says. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. So they asked this question. So Jesus, what do you think? Moses says we're supposed to throw rocks and kill her because of the affair, because of adultery, right? What do you think, Jesus? And instead of answering, he bends down in the sand and he begins to write with his finger. Crazy. I mean, I'm pretty sure that most of the people there were going, uh, we weren't expecting that. But what was going on? We don't know. The truth is the Bible doesn't tell us what Jesus was writing. But many theologians believe this, that what Jesus was doing was he, he bent down and was writing with his finger in the sand the sins of these religious leaders that brought this lady. Can you imagine Jesus writing down and maybe one of the guy's name is Larry and he's writing in the, in the dirt, Larry, I know what's on your browser history. Whoa, what? All of a sudden, Larry's going, oh, this is turning an awkward way. And all of a sudden, Jesus starts writing down adultery, and they're thinking, oh, he's, okay, it's about this woman now that we brought. But instead, he puts one of the other guy's names after that. And he goes, oh, Jesus knows that I've had adultery? And all of a sudden, could it possibly be that that's what Jesus was doing, is writing down in the dirt, in the sand, the sins that these guys had that brought her to her. Can you imagine that? Oh, as soon as they see their name and their sin written there, they're, they're just probably, oh my goodness, right? Verse seven through 11, it says this. When they kept on questioning Jesus, he straightened up and said to them, let any, any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And then what did he do? Again, Jesus then stooped down and wrote on the ground again. <laughs> I love how he handles these things. I don't know, if, to me this is almost humorous. And all of a sudden it tells us this. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones left first until only Jesus was left with the woman standing there. So just picture this. You're standing there and you're watching this thing. You're at church, this, you know, it's this temple, but this is the church. And Jesus is teaching and all of a sudden here comes the religious leaders with this lady that's had an affair and they're doing all these things and you're just standing there watching. I mean, it's just fascinating, right? And all of a sudden, when he says, those of you who haven't sinned, you can cast the first stone. And it says from the oldest to the youngest, the oldest wise, because they were wiser and they've lived longer and they've probably done a whole lot more sins. And that's why they dropped their rocks first and started leaving. And one by one they left till Jesus was left alone with the woman standing there. Jesus straightened up and he asked her, where, where are your accusers? Has no, one, has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your sin. Go now and leave your life of sin. You know what he didn't say? He, Jesus didn't say, now go and just do what you feel like. He didn't say to her, now, now go, go and just follow your heart. He didn't say that. Uh, Jesus didn't say, now go and be happy. Jesus, Jesus didn't say that. Jesus instead said, go now and leave your life of sin. Can I tell you that's exactly what he tells you and me? Whatever our 
our worst sin that we've ever done that's been exposed to people, just like this lady had, where she was brought out of adultery and standing right there, probably wearing hardly anything because she probably just grabbed a blanket off the bed as quickly as possible to wrap herself around. How embarrassing. Think about the most embarrassing thing you've ever done. And all of a sudden, realize that Jesus is the same thing to you and I. When he tells us this, he says, go now and leave your life of sin. He doesn't tell us, go be happy. He doesn't tell us to go follow our heart. He tells us to go and leave our sin. That's what he tells you and I to do. But let's be honest. (laughs) Sometimes sin is fun, isn't it? Sometimes sin is fun. Because really, uh, even scripture tells us this. Scripture tells us that there's pleasure in sin for a season. Can I remind you of something? This last week, we were in spring. As of yesterday, we now are in summer. The seasons change. There is pleasure in sin for a season, but it will change just like the seasons do. It'll be pleasure for a while, but after a while, it will not be pleasurable. It will cause problems instead. In fact, if you don't think that there's, there's, that there's fun in sin, you're probably doing it wrong, right? Because why else would people sin if it, wasn't, if it was bad all the time? People sin because it's fun, because it's exciting, it's new, it's adventuresome. It's, that's why people do. If you are saying, oh, there's no fun in sin, you're doing it wrong. But here's the thing we have to understand. The thing we have to understand is this. Sin promises pleasure at the cost of disobedience to God and eventually pain to you. Let me say that again. Sin promises pleasure at the cost of disobedience to God and of eventual pain to you. Yes, it may not be pain at first, but again, as the seasons change, you will have pain. You will have something. It'll come out, and all of a sudden, you're going to be ashamed, and you're going to be embarrassed. Now, I was thinking about it this, this week as I was working on the message. How did this woman get in this place? Why did she have an a, Why was she caught in adultery? Why was she having an affair? It could be. I mean, we don't know. Scripture doesn't tell us, but let's just talk, just think through this. Could it be? Could it be that she woke up one morning and said, you know, I'm just, I'm going to try to ruin somebody's marriage. It could be, but probably not. What makes more sense to me is this, is that she was probably married and somewhere along the line, because if you are newly married, I mean, you've just been done, done dating and all of a sudden you got married and now you're in the first year or two or so and everything's just awesome and great. But over time, if you don't keep dating your spouse, begin to, to keep that, that love alive, pretty soon the, the flame of love kind of trickles down and eventually goes out. And maybe she found herself in a, in a flat marriage. She's in a marriage that there's no love, there's no really conversation anymore, we don't do anything, it's just flat, it's just blah. And she took a job. And somewhere at her job, possibly, she began to talk with a coworker. He's new. And all of a sudden, as they get talking and begin to, to know each other, they kind of have fun, and she's, she kind of enjoys his company and talking with him and stuff. And, and, and she's thinking, you know, boy, he's really easy to talk to. I wish my husband was that way. I wish he would talk with me and he would listen to me and blah, blah, blah. But it's just a friendship with this guy. And over time, things begin to kind of change. Pretty soon, pretty soon, she's sharing about her relationship at home. Pretty soon, this guy at work is noticing her hair and she's thinking, my husband doesn't even notice my hair. He doesn't notice when I change or anything. But this guy notices it. And once, maybe one night, 
After work, they worked late into the night. They had a project to do. And maybe as they're at the, at, at the work, just to the two of them working on this project, their, their guard gets down and, and he's sharing about his marriage and how his wife doesn't really appreciate him anymore and all that stuff. And, and she's thinking to herself, she's thinking, boy, he, would, he could make me happy. I, want, I need something happy in my life like my husband used to do, but he just isn't doing it anymore. And what really happens is step by step, oftentimes innocent step by step, leads us into areas that we shouldn't be going into. It leads us into sin. It leads, it leads us into places that will hurt us and will disobey God. Now, let me, let me just tell you, you may, be, you may find this uh, online stream right now and you are not a follower of Jesus. You do whatever you want. But if there's something within you that you are like, man, I want to know God. I want to have a relationship with God. It starts by having a relationship with him and, obe and have obedience to him, to what he calls us to do. If you call yourself a follower of Jesus Christ, a Christian, this is what he's telling us to do. We are to obey what God calls us to do. Not to do what we want to be happy about, but to actually listen and obey what God has called you and I to do. See, if we do the right things, we get rewarded. But sometimes what happens is this. We sin, we disobey God, and it eventually causes pain for us. It does. So how do we get there? I think the problem is a lot of people do not believe in absolute truth. People will say, there is no absolute truth. And, and, and they say, well, that may be truth for you, but it's not truth for me. That may be right for you, but it's not right for me. But here's something I want, I want to give you notes. Without a belief in absolute truth, and let's pause for just a second. Who is absolute truth? The only person, listen, listen. The only person who is absolute truth is God. I do not have absolute truth. I think I have truths that I believe, but I am not the absolute truth. And can I just encourage and lovingly say to you, neither are you. You do not have all the absolute truth. Not everything that you believe is absolute truth. But God is absolute truth. And without a belief in absolute truth, then truth is defined by whatever makes me happy. Without God, who is absolute, absolute truth, the truth is defined by whatever makes me happy and whatever makes you happy. That's what happens. And listen, and when the goal is my happiness and when the goal for you is your happiness, then happiness becomes the standard by which I and you are judged by our actions. See, when we, let me say that again, when the goal is my happiness, then happiness becomes the standard by which I judge my actions. So, what's the root cause of this problem? Well, we think happiness and holiness are at odds. We think happiness and holiness can't, can't work together. And so therefore, I don't want to just be holy. I want to be happy, but I can't be happy and holy. That's what we think. But can I tell you, I don't think that's actually correct. Do you think, here, here it's Father's Day. Let's go back to Father's Day. Did you know that in scripture, God's word tells us that he is our heavenly father. And here it is Father's Day. He is our heavenly father. Do you think God is, is peering out of heaven, looking down on us and going, oh, I want them to be holy and I also want them to be miserable. He's a heavenly father. What kind of a father, what kind of a mother, what kind of any parent would want their kid to be miserable? No. You want your kid to do the right things. That's the holiness with God. Do the right things. You want your kids to stand up to bullies. 
You want your, if somebody's being bullied, you want your kid to stand up for that kid that's being bullied, right? You want them to do the right thing. But yet here, we think, well, doing the right thing and being holy, oh, that just, that's just not happy. I mean, that's, those, those don't work together. Yes, they do. Let me tell you, the more, listen, the more you get to know God, the more that you honor him, you obey him, the better it goes in your life. When we disobey God, oh my goodness, then life just starts falling apart and has problems, just like what this lady had in the story. See, God is the author of life. He created life. He created you. He knows how is the best way to have life done. But yet we think we know what's better. And we're going, yeah, thanks, God. That's a good a suggestion. But I have, the per- I have the absolute truth. I know what's better for me. Whatever makes me happy. And God's going, wow. Everything you want is just happy, happy, happy. But did you know God? God says, you can be happy and holy. You can have both. It can be both. This is something that God has told us about over and over. Let me give you a verse. In Matthew 7, 11, it says this. If you then, who are evil, so, so God is speaking to us. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Hmm. Interesting. In other words, if we, our parents, are, you know, we give our good stuff to our kids, right? We feed them, we, we bathe them, we clothe them, we, we give them education, we give them toys when they're little. I mean, all this, we take care of our kids, right? But yet we're evil. We're fallen in a sinful, fallen world here. And as we are sinful and broken and in a sinful, fallen world, God is saying, but you still give good gifts. How much more... I, God, give good gifts. See, if we find ourselves at odds with, I want to be holy, but I don't want to be unhappy. The problem is, listen, the problem is you're looking for happiness in the wrong place. You're looking for happiness in the wrong place. And you're you're looking at a lower place. When God designed you and me, for a higher place. Did you know that? Think about that. You are looking at a lower place when God has designed you for a higher place. (laughs) Think about that. Man, that's amazing. So, what do you do when you know it's wrong? You know what happens? We end up falling into sin. We end up falling into things that become sin. We thought it'd make us happy. Some of you are addicted to alcohol right now. Some of you are struggling with alcohol or something else that you're medicating yourself with. You thought it would make you happy, but now it really doesn't. You're just addicted to it. Some of you are smoking. Some of you are popping pills, doing drugs. Others of you, you are feeling the, you're filling up the void within you by by eating a bunch of food. You're eating food all the time. You sit down and you get a, with your two best friends, Ben and Jerry, and you just eat and eat and eat because you're trying to fill that gap that's within you. Sometimes, some of you are so empty inside that the best way that you fill that emptiness is by spending money. So you go out and you buy a purse, you buy shoes, you buy clothes, you buy, you buy a sports car. Because you're just trying to fill the gap within your life. For some, you are in a prison of lust that you don't know how to stop or get out of. And it was fun at the beginning because, again, there's pleasure in sin for a season, but then seasons change. And all of a sudden, it's not pleasurable anymore. All of a sudden, it's I do not like who I've become. I don't know what to do to how to get out of this. I know this isn't right. I keep asking God to help me and I just don't have anything happen. I don't know what to do. And you just are stuck in this prison of lust. Wow. 
this is not God's heart for you. This is not God's heart for me. This is not what God wants for you and I to be a part of. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says this. This is Paul. Paul is one of my favorite people. In fact, I've been reading in the book of Acts this last week, and I've been reading about Paul. Uh, man, I tell you, when I die and get to heaven, Paul is one of the first people I want to go talk to. Paul was a guy who was against Jesus. Jesus died, rose again, appeared to him, and all of a sudden, instead of Paul fighting against the early church, he started the early church. It's an amazing, amazing story. You got to read the Bible sometime. But Paul says this, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are, te are tempted. Now, that doesn't say, but if you are tempted. It says, but when you are tempted. In other words, God's word is being very honest. We will all be tempted. But when you are tempted, our God will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. God will give us a way out. About I think two or three months ago, we did a series on temptation and it was called Escape. And we talked about this. God will give us a way out. When we are tempted, God will give us a way out. Did you know, in fact, here's something for your notes. Every temptation is an invitation to depend on Christ. Every temptation is an invitation to depend on Christ. Every time you are tempted, that is God saying, okay, I'm giving you right now an invitation to depend on me. The enemy comes with the temptation, right? Jesus comes with an invitation. The enemy comes to tempt us. And when Jesus sees that happen, he goes, I'm giving you an invitation to depend on me. You see, scripture is very clear about this. Scripture is very clear. When we are tempted, he will give us a way out. And then in the book of James, it also tells us this. That when we sin, we can be free from our sin by celebrating and, and opening up to other persons, to other people. So in other words, let me just put it this way. When we sin, we talk to God and ask for forgiveness. But it talks about in James is that when we share with other people, then we are healed. So we, we talk to Jesus and he forgives us for what we've done. And then we talk to people, not everybody, but just one or two close friends that also are followers of Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden, as you begin to open up and tell them your struggle, tell them your addiction, tell them the problem that you're dealing with, all of a sudden what happens? You can be healed because now you have one, two, maybe three people that you are sharing this with and they are, they are your confidants. They're not telling it to anybody else, but they are holding you accountable. They are checking in on you to make sure that you are doing good. And they are giving you permission like at two o'clock in the morning, if you struggled in this, you can call them and they'll be right there. Can I tell you, this is God's way. Whenever there's a temptation, God gives us an invitation to depend on him. This is God's heart. Hmm. So, what do you think God's thinking about your sin? Think, just think right now. What is the sin that you're dealing with right now? And if, you, and if you can't think of any, you're lying. Because everybody struggles with something. I struggle, you struggle. We all are sinful fallen people in a sinful fold where we all are broken. We all need help in some area of our lives. What is that area of your life that you are struggling with? Think about that. Think about that thing. What, 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 would, what would Jesus say? Would he come alongside and say, oh, I am so embarrassed by what you're doing. I can't believe that you're still doing that. that, that, that that's gonna just send you right down south. You're not coming to heaven. Forget it. No. But sometimes we think that's what it is, right? I believe this. I believe that what Jesus said to this woman that was caught in adultery, he says to us, neither do I 
neither do I condemn you. Neither do, will I throw stones at you. Leave your, lo- your life of sin. Leave your life of sin and go in peace. See, God's on our corner. He's not there judging and angry. He's in our corner trying to help us to do the right things, to encourage us. What if you thought of God that way? See, a lot of times we think of him as just big and angry and mad. He's going to, you know, smote me, whatever smote means. You know, smote me. What if God is the loving, caring, caring God that we saw with Jesus and this woman caught in adultery? Hmm. You see, I don't know if you realize this, but there is a big difference. There's a big difference between remorse and repentance. Remorse is this. I am sorry. Why are you sorry? I am sorry. I have remorse. I am sorry because I got caught. That's really what remorse is. I am sorry that I got caught. Or really, I am sorry that you caught me. That's really what remorse is. Repent, though, is totally different. The word, the re and pent, it's really two different words. Re means to turn around. So, for example, if I was going to walk from my house to a store, I would walk this way and then I would return around to go back home. So re means to turn. But repent, re means to turn. The pent means high. Like that's where we get the word penthouse. The highest house on the building. That is the penthouse. So we are to repent. We are to turn from our sin and go back to God and to live in the high ways that he calls us to. Not the low ways, not in the sin, not in all the struggle, but in the higher areas that God has for you and I. My hope, listen, my hope and my prayer is many of you right now would return to God. After hearing this message, after understanding where you are in your life and the struggles and the difficulties and the problems you're dealing with, that you would return to God. And in fact, you know, when you look at that re, there, you know, there's a lot of our words that have a re right in front of it. And so kind of came across this, um, this sentence, this paragraph that I thought, man, this is genius. And I just want to share it with you. It has a lots of re's in it, Okay. Let's start here. When you rebuke the enemy, now hit pause for a second. When you rebuke the enemy, did you know that we have the same enemy? Our, our enemy is not the left or the right. Our, our, our um, enemy is not Democrat or Republic. Our enemy isn't one race versus another race. Our enemy is the same. It's the devil. It's Satan. Satan hates God so much. But he, how do you hurt God? So you hurt what God loves, which is you and me. It's people. And our spiritual enemy, whether you are a follower of Jesus Christ or not, we all have the same spiritual enemy. Spiritual enemy Satan is trying to keep us, those of us who are followers of Christ, pulled away from Jesus. And those who don't know Jesus, he's trying to keep them away from Jesus so they'll never get to know him. We have the same spiritual enemy. And you know what he loves to do the best? Divide. He loves to divide marriages and families and people groups. And our country and our world is just crazy right now. Can I tell you, this is not God's heart. We need to all unify together. And I'm talking everything, not just races. I'm talking left and right. I'm talking about Democrat, Republic. I'm talking about everything. We all need to unify around the person of Jesus Christ. It all, it all, it all comes down to Jesus. I'm going to tell you, doesn't matter if you're left or right, if you're Democrat or Republic, you're not everybody has the answers, but God does. He is the one. And when you rebuke the enemy and return to God by repenting 
of your sins and receiving Christ. Your spirit is reborn, your mind renewed, your life rebuilt. And while you're reconciled by the grace of Jesus Christ, you reap the rewards of relationship, causing revival to break three. Does somebody say amen around here? Not in this room because it's empty, but maybe in your home. See, God has a better place, a better plan for you and I if we would just follow what he's called you and I to do. God doesn't tell us, go and be happy. God doesn't go and say, just go and follow your heart. Do whatever you want. Just try not to hurt people. He doesn't say that. He has a higher standard for you and I. And whenever the enemy begins to tempt us, Jesus comes in with an invitation to depend on him. Let's pray. <clears throat> so Father, right now, I thank you for this message. I thank you, God, for how you, Jesus, how you showed amazing grace to this woman caught in adultery. And then when, <clears throat> when everybody left her and they weren't gonna throw stones at her and try and kill her, instead, instead, she felt your love and your grace. And you didn't say, now go be happy. Go follow your heart. Go do what you think is right. You told her to leave her life of sin. And Lord, you tell us the same thing. And so Lord, right now there are people on the sound of my voice that are watching this and they're going, I need help. God, I'm struggling. I've been having this addiction, this problem, this sin for so long. But Lord, I understand today that when the enemy comes with temptation, you, Jesus, always give me an invitation to depend on you because you are there to help me. And you also tell me in James that I can be forgiven by you, but I can be healed by other people because I need people that have you living inside them that are looking in my eyes and asking me the tough questions and holding me accountable. And Lord, I pray for those right now that need this. Would you help them to go to the places, to the people that they know that are Jesus followers that would help them so that they can finally, they can finally, they can finally be healed. It's no longer being happy. It's being holy. And as we're being holy and we're obeying you, all of a sudden life just begins to fit together better and to work. So Lord, I thank you. And Father, right now, I also want to pray a blessing over all the dads. Thank you for each of the dads. The ones who are raising their kids now, the ones who maybe their kids are out of the nest and the ones that maybe, unfortunately, some of their kids or a one of them maybe has maybe even passed on. Lord, would you just bless these dads today? And Lord, I pray that me as a father and all the other fathers that are on this right now, we would always look to you as our heavenly father, as our example of what we should and shouldn't do. Lord, today, I pray for those that do not know you. And I pray that you would help them to come into relationship. And there may be some right now that are bowing their heart and saying, today on Father's Day, I'm acknowledging that God, you are my heavenly father and I need you. I wanna be your son or daughter. I come to you right now and I ask for forgiveness. And I thank you for all that you are doing. I thank you that you love me. I thank you that you forgive me. I thank you that you always give me an invitation to depend on you whenever I'm struggling. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I thank you for those that are making that decision and we celebrate that all, all the time here and I'm so thankful for what you are doing today. And we celebrate you this Father's Day, God. In your name we pray, amen. Hey, before we go, a couple things. <clears throat> Number one, if you just said yes to Jesus, would you text the word Jesus to the number on your screen? Uh, that's, then what's gonna happen is uh, tomorrow, from Monday through Friday of this week, I'm gonna be sending you some videos every day. You're gonna get one video. It's gonna be about three minutes and it'll just help you every day, Monday through Friday, to know uh, what it means to have a relationship with Jesus and, uh, and how do you grow in your relationship with Jesus. Now, here's something else. Uh, during the summer, 
Uh, we usually don't have any small groups going on and we usually don't have any uh, questions off the message. But we wanna, we wanna do something for the summer. So here's what we're doing for the summer. We're, we're gonna call it uh, Continue the Conversation. And whether you are doing a small group or maybe you just wanna do these questions with your family or maybe you just wanna ask the questions to yourself. We're gonna give every week two questions based on the message. So the, to continue the conversation, here's the, here's the two questions for this week. Where are some wrong places that people look for happiness? That's one of the questions. You can ask your spouse, your family, just yourself, your group, whatever. And then the second question is this, where is a wrong place you look for happiness? So that's how you continue the conversation. One other thing, uh, we, since the, the pandemic started, uh, we've been doing devotions Monday through Friday, uh, but starting this, this week, we're only going to be doing Wednesdays during the summer. Summer devotions will be Wednesdays at noon, and I uh, hope that you're able to be a part of that. If you can't, you can watch it later uh, as a video, whatever works for you. But just want to let you know a few things. Now, we're going to go back and have an ending song. So glad that you're with us today. I search the world But it couldn't fill me A man's empty praise The treasures that fade Are never enough You came along And put me back together Desire is now satisfied here in your love. No, there's nothing better than you. 
Hey, C3, thanks so much for joining us. We would love to hear from you and hear about what God is doing in your life. In fact, if you just asked Jesus to be your savior, we would love to hear about it and celebrate with you. All you gotta do is text the word Jesus to the number 509-309-8284, and we'll send you a short Devo video series from Pastor Mark explaining your new life in Christ. You can also reach out to us by filling out the connection card on our C3 Tri-Cities app. We love connecting with you, celebrating with you, and praying for you, and the connection card is the best way to do that. If you're looking for more resources, you can find a ton of options on our website, c3tricities.com. There you'll find resources for kids, students, parents, counseling, and a whole lot more. Make sure you check it out. If you've got students in middle school or high school, our C3 Students Instagram feed uh, and our YouTube have a live broadcast every Wednesday night at 6.30. And the C3 Students Instagram also has live prayer and devotionals every single day at noon. It's a great place for students to get together, connect, share, and grow every single day. We wanna say a special thank you also to everyone who financially supports the mission of C3. Your faithfulness and generosity is how we're able to continue sharing the good news of Jesus. Thank you for partnering with us. You can find ways that you can help to contribute by going to c3tricities.com and click on the button that says give. Thanks again for joining us. We look forward to seeing you soon.